All right, uh, let's start with me. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. My name is Adele. I'm an engineering manager. I work at Zendesk. For the last four years, I've led innovation projects there. We've been working on a second act to our spectacular support product. Uh, the TLDR I have for you on that is it's really hard, and I should write a talk about that one day. Uh, two and a half years ago, as part of our innovation work, we acquired a startup in San Francisco. Uh, it was built entirely in Go. It was a three-year-old startup, and they had optimized for one thing only, and that was speed of feature development. They hadn't optimized for anything else. So I like to think that I've seen the worst that anyone could do with the Go programming language, but also in the last couple of years, working, uh, starting from that code base and working on it, uh, on a, an event processing system, very high volume, you know, Zendesk is quite big, uh, and fairly complicated distributed asynchronous system, uh, I've seen some of the power that Go has as well. So thank you so much for having me here, and I hope you find something useful in what I'm going to say. Um, just on that note, this talk is not about me getting up here and saying, diversity and inclusion are really good things, and you should totally believe in them. That's not what this talk is. Maybe I'll do that talk another day, but I don't think so. I'm, I'm not a big fan of trying to change people's minds. So uh, if you're the sort of person that thinks that James Damore was a sensible fellow with lots of good ideas, or if you think that young ladies aren't getting into maths and STEM in high school because girls' brains aren't very good at maths and logic, this talk is gonna be kind of boring and annoying for you. So uh, feel free to crack open Candy Crush or whatever you've got and you know wait for your free T-shirt and that's totally fine, totally fine. All are welcome here. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, I thought I'd start with who am I, because I'm talking about inclusiveness today, and you'll see that my examples come from me. And one of the big things that I think that's really important when we're talking about inclusiveness is to not try and speak for other people. In fact, to give them the agency to speak for themselves or allow them the space to speak for themselves. So a lot of my examples will come from this kind of perspective. Uh, some of this is stereotypical, some of this is less than stereotypical. This is my dog, Sasha, she's beautiful. She appears in all my talks. So that's what you'll hear from me. Gorgeous. Now, I also want to talk about why I'm super excited about talking about inclusivity and diversity, because it's never been my day job. It's still not my day job. But I am super excited about this work. I'm very passionate about it. I spend a lot of my spare time and energy working on it. So I want you to know why I do that. First reason is a very similar group of people have been at the controls for quite a while now, the last couple of thousand years, give or take the odd empire here or there. And there have been lots of really, really great things that have come out of the last couple of thousand years. But as we move forward and as technology becomes really the defining force for how we live our lives and who gets access and who, gets do who doesn't, I think maybe we should um, try a bit harder to make sure a few more people get a turn at the wheel. So I'm not sure if you've seen this. this one of the ladies at work sent me this. Sort of soap dispensers. It doesn't work if you have dark skin. Yeah, it's the kind of thing, stupid mistake. We don't need to make that kind of mistake anymore. We're all connected now. And we should give a, yeah, some other people a turn at the wheel. The other, one of the other reasons that I get super excited about this stuff is, uh, and I love the, the last talk, the basic program. When I was in year eight, I was at school, in school in South Australia. And I did some basic programming and I really liked it. I liked the scrolling Adele was here, infinite scroll thing was my, my particular signature. And then I worked, moved from South Australia at the end of year eight to Canberra in year nine. And I sat down with, at my new school with the teachers and they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd really like to do computer programming, please, because I really like it. And they said, oh no, dear, that's not for you. You're gonna go into the word processing class. And so I went into the word processing class. And the upside of that is I have really fast typing. The downside of that is that it took me 11 years to get back into this industry. A lot of dead ends, a lot of wasted time. And look, these people may have had good intentions. Maybe they didn't think I would succeed in a classroom full of boys. Or maybe they thought that my young lady brain would overheat. I'm not really sure which way, but I fluked my way back into the industry, and I'm here now, and I'm gonna hold the door open for as many people as I can while I can. So, very, very excited. Thank you. You should do it too, you should do it too. And then the last reason I get excited about this is a few years ago, uh, I was working on a team at Lonely Planet 
and the team lead left the team, and when she said she was leaving the team, she turned to me and said, Adele, you're the new team lead, because no one else is going to do it, goodbye. Okay. Uh, it turns out I really like managing people and I really like running teams. It's awesome. And if the better I get at diversity and inclusion, the better I get at running teams. And you don't have to take my word for it. This is from my last performance review. Thank you very much. I am awesome. <laughs> Uh, and I think one of the reasons that people think that I'm awesome is because um, I create teams that are resilient. I've worked in lots of environments, as I'm sure that you all do as well, where there's a huge amount of change and there's a huge amount of uncertainty. And in order to weather that, it helps if you have a team that has a lot of different kinds of folks in it. Some people seem to think that the best thing you can do if you want to build good software is build a homogenous team of people that all think the same way and look the same way and, I don't know, do things the same. I think when you do that, you create a really fragile team because what you've got when you've got a team like this is a team that has all the same blind spots and all the same weaknesses. When I create teams, those teams have lots of blind spots and lots of weaknesses, but they have lots of strengths and lots of perspectives that tend to balance that out unlike the fragility of certain other approaches to the industry. So, that's me, that's what gets me excited. Now, I wanna talk about why I'm here today, and I think it's best summed up by this. I'm tired, and I need your help. So I'm gonna to talk to you about why I'm tired, and I'm gonna to talk to you about how you can help, which is the far more interesting part of the talk. So firstly, let's talk about why I'm tired. Uh, last week, I was in a meeting at work. Um, there were a bunch of senior male engineers there, they were talking about something, I wasn't really paying attention, I was on my phone. Someone said the word diversity, everybody stopped talking and looked at me. <laughs> and this has happened to me since my first day on my first job. And I have no idea, it's like a sign on my butt or something that says I am a diversity expert, that I know the answers when someone says how can we create a more diverse workforce, that I know that I'm going to lead the work or do the work to create a diverse workforce. I don't know when that happened, but it, it, it happened. And it's tiring, you know, it's, I'm 10 years into my career, sort of, depending on how you slice the career now, and, um, and yeah, and I'm tired. Um, so I've become, I've become the de facto diversity expert. Um, and I'm going to try very, very hard not to speak for anyone else today, as I said, but I had a little bit of a look around the internet, as you do, and it seems like I'm not the only person that has been put in this position. Uh, there are a lot of amazing people out there talking about the different ways as well, because it's not all, always the same thing, but the different ways in which they are somehow expected to be exceptional software developers and save the world, or and change the culture, or and do all this other work. If you don't watch any other of these, or read any of, of the bottom one, that first talk, Tanya Riley being glue, talks to, and I'm, I'm not talking about a female experience, because I'm sure many of the people in this audience will have had the same experience of how the, that invisible teamwork that you do, that might be culture related or socially related, or it can be anything. Tanya says it much better than me. I'm not even gonna try. Watch the talk, especially if you're a manager. I think every manager in tech should, should watch that talk. Fantastic, fantastic. So these are people who, who talk about it better than I do. Um, the other reason that I'm tired is I just got a new job. I've spent four years leading this, these innovation projects at Zendesk, and now I have a different job, which is, it's a bit vague, but essentially what I'm trying to do is answer the question for myself and for Zendesk. Can we keep this really kind, really human-centered management that we've had so far in our company history, growing like crazy, can we keep that as we scale and as we become not like a, you know, one of the bigger startups, but one of the smaller big guys. Can we hold on to that? Can we put keep people first and still make money? So I'm very excited about that. But what that means is I would like to spend all of my time doing that, please. I don't want to have to do all this other stuff that I do on the side. And I sat down and I wrote down all the other stuff that I do on the side, and this is it. And I've sat down, I've got a whole team at work, I'm calling them Zendesk Ambassadors, and they're going to take on this work for me so that I can do the research and the focus that I need on the new job so maybe I could get somewhat good at that, who knows, or, or have some impact there. Um, and so, yeah. 
Ask around, look around at your companies, look at the people in your teams, look at the people that you work with, and think who's doing this stuff. And if it's not you, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Get to this point, how you can help. Firstly, I want to talk about uh, what I mean by help. It's actually not the right word at all, I think. When I was little, my mom would ask me to help with the dishes, and I hated doing housework. I still do. And she'd have to ask me half a dozen times, and eventually I would drag myself into the kitchen and smear grease around on a pan until she took it away from me and said, ugh, just go away, and I would be very happy. Uh, that's not the kind of help I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the kind of help where you work out what is important to you, the people around you, and your life, and you lead initiatives, and you make plans, and you ask people like me to come and help you, because that's, that's what we need. So, how do you help? Let's get into that. First of all, you're going to need to motivate yourself. This is work. I love software development. The first day in programming class, I still remember it back in 1989. I still remember the first programming class when I went back to TAFE many, many, many years later after I found my way back to the interesting. I love it. So to stop doing that and to do something else at work when you're being paid to do this, it's hard. You've got to have very strong motivation. You've got to have good reasons to do what you do. So, how do you motivate yourselves? I have no idea. I don't know you. I don't know what makes you happy. I don't know what irritates you. I don't know what your causes are. So you need to go do that. You've seen mine. I hope that inspires you to go and find some of your own. Then, the next step you'll need to take in working in DNI, diversity and inclusion in this area, is to educate yourself. So again, don't turn to the person with the sign on, the, on their butt at work and say, oh, how can I help or what can I do or tell me what to do? No, get out there and learn. I did become, I'm not going to say an expert by any means, but someone who can stand up at a gopher con and talk to you about this kind of stuff because I educated myself. And where did I start? Exactly the same place that I started when I'm learning to code or I'm learning anything new. I went and I Googled and I read and I listened and I tried to work out which sources were more, um, more viable, which were more credible and which weren't. And I made some mistakes and then I tried things. So starting with Googling. Get out there, there's a ton of resources in this area. Uh, in whatever area of, of inclusion that you're interested in, I guarantee you there will be smart people writing about it. Okay, so let me talk you through an example of how I've done this. So one of the communities that I have been getting into recently, and it's because I'm a lady in the world and I have a body, so from the second I could crawl, I've been told that my body wasn't good enough and it was gross. I got into the fatness community. Now, standing up here, even saying the word fatness makes me feel so awkward. But the reason I'm saying it is because I've read a ton of blog posts recently from a lot of different larger people who hate the way that word has been taken to, from the meaning of something that is larger to something that is inextricably tied to a moral or a value kind of failing. And they want to reclaim that word and they think that all of us should start using that word. So I'm gonna try. Uh, but started getting into this community, and as I got into this community, and this is one of the things that you will find as you research, as you educate yourself, is that it becomes a lot more nuanced. So if I start with Jamila Jamil, fantastic actress from uh, The Good Place, doing incredible work in the area of trying to help young women especially, but unfortunately I feel like this is an area in which we have gained a fair bit of parity. Uh, in, we've all been taught now to hate the way we look so that we buy more pills and potions. Um, she's got a great uh, movement called iWay, which is fantastic. And her approach to this issue of body image and body image in society is what she calls body neutrality. So she's a slender person, as you can see. Um, so she doesn't have to deal with some of the issues that larger people have to deal with. And so she just likes to see her body as a thing. It's a thing that has a job to do, and as long as it's doing that job fairly well, it's all good, and she's not interested in labeling it as a good body or a good looking or bad or this or that or whatever. Then if we go here, this is Body Posi Panda. She's a, um, a fantastic woman. She's on Instagram, and she belongs to, the, or she seems to be spearheading, uh, the body positivity movement. So that is a movement that's trying to rewrite the narrative that we've all been taught that bigger bodies are bad and smaller bodies are better. So she posts tons of gorgeous photos of herself, and she's trying to do it through actually living this, this new story that she would like us all to adopt. And then lastly, we've got Sophie Hagen. She's a stand-up comedian from Denmark. I think she's quite amusing. Feel free to look her stuff up. She's cool. 
but she is a fat liberationist. She is not interested in body positivity, negativity, neutrality, anything. She wants to smash the whole capitalist system that makes money off the fact that we hate the way we look. I think she's pretty cool. So you can see, even getting into it, this is just some kind of little movement that I, I looked into over the last few months. There's a lot there. And so it's all out there. Go look at it. You're all expert Googlers. I don't need to tell you how, how that's done. All right, so now you've got some academic understanding. You've sat alone with your device and you've learned some things. Now it's time to take that knowledge out into the real world and engage with people. So how can we do that? The first thing we need to do is establish trust and respect. No problem, Adele, that's easy. Um, but it is a critical part of the process and it's a critical first step. Because without trust and respect, you're not going to, people aren't going to be vulnerable with you. They're not going to tell you what their needs are. They're not going to be open with you. And why should they be if there's no trust and respect? So there's different ways that you do this, of course, and I'm, again, not here to, to give you solutions for your context, but if I can use as an example this conference, if you go to that front, the, the, the website of the conference, the first sentence is, we are an inclusive conference and we welcome you here. And it continues on throughout the spiel, which is lovely. It's got a very nice code of conduct at the bottom, which is great. There's a section on what to do if you feel like you've been excluded or you feel like something has happened that's made you feel uncomfortable. There's, um, you know, the pronoun stuff that I've got on my little, um, on my lanyard here. So there's lots and lots of different little things that you can do to establish trust and respect without necessarily having to become someone's best friend. So think about it in your context and how it would work for you, because without starting here, then you're not going to get very far. The next thing I'd like you to do is ask, ask questions. What do you need? How can I help in your specific circumstance? Uh, what assistance or what, what, are, what are we not providing that we should, whatever it is. So just ask. As a pair with ask, a critical pair, listen to the answer. I know that might seem obvious, but it's amazing how many people are just asking to make themselves feel better, then they can cross off I asked from the list and they're done. And the next stage of listening past actually just listening is trying to listen as much as you can without your filter. So an example of this in my life is I hired a fantastic woman uh, to be one of my team leads uh, about a year and a half ago, and Zendesk was lucky enough to get her in her first job out of India. And so we would hang out and we would talk, and she would tell me stories about her life in India and her work in India. And I was listening with the ears of some like coddled white lady from Australia, and I'd be saying, oh my God, that's terrible. How could you do that? That's awful. And she had to stop me and go, no, Adele, I wanted to be in that situation. I chose that situation, and that situation was really, really good for me. I was taking away her agency by projecting how much I wouldn't have liked you know, what she was going through myself. And that's not what listening is about. Listening is about listening to the person, not listening based on what you would have done in that situation. And then the last thing that I'm going to need you to do is to pay attention to keep an eye, not a creepy eye, just a nice eye. And a story that I have that illustrates this, I think, quite well is, if we go way back, in my 20s I was quite sick, in my early 20s I was bedridden, in my late 20s I was getting out of bed, in my 30s I was sick a lot. And I worked from my mid-20s onwards. And I had a huge amount of shame and fear about being found out at being sick at work. I thought that all kinds of bad things would happen. I'd get fired or they wouldn't give me good work or I don't even know what I thought would happen. Something bad. So then I start work at Zendesk. I work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. By Wednesday night, it's very obvious to me, I'd had a, a minor operation six weeks before. I was supposed to be fine. I was not fine. I then had to take six weeks off three days into my first week at Zendesk. And when I came back into that office, I was so embarrassed. I was walking in just filled with shame. Everyone's gonna judge me. Everyone's gonna look at me and think that I'm useless. Everyone's gonna know that I'm no good. It's Zendesk, so they gave me a round of applause and gave me a cake, which was very nice. <laughs> Even better, my boss, who is a person that, after working with him for two years, I really respect him. I didn't know him at the time. Never for a second did the Oh, are you okay, Adele? Oh, maybe you should go. No, I need you to do this. I need you to fix this. I've got this problem here. It's yours now. Just treated me like a normal person, which was really cool. But beyond that, 
I never sat him down and said, hey, Brett, I'm terrified that you're going to fire me because I've got a long history of illness. But he worked it out. And for the next two years, if ever he saw that I wasn't feeling well, Adele, go home. Zendesk isn't going to go broke because you took a day off. If I had something to do that I thought was important, Adele, it's not that important. We'll get someone else to cover for you, or we'll move it to next week. He constantly reinforced over a couple of years that it was OK to be sick, and it was OK for me to go home when I was sick. And now, four years later, I take a sick day when I get sick. And of course, this is a massive benefit to Zendesk, because instead of working myself into the, a ground, the ground for a month. No, don't do that. Um, instead of working myself into the ground and then having to take multiple weeks off, uh, I now take a couple of week, days off like a normal person, get better, and then come back to work, and it's all good. So this part of being inclusive is crucial. But you're going to have to work on your people skills. And you're going to have to work on your ability to pay attention. All right, what comes after this? Now, identify your blind spots. So this is where you need, really need to take a look at your own life and your own the, your perspective and, again, identify where you might be projecting that perspective onto other people. I am a white woman. I sit next to a Vietnamese man at Zendesk. I cannot speak to his experience at Zendesk or how he moves through the world. That's his job, and it's not something that I should be doing. Um, I, at school, I had the kind of brain that worked really well with our academic structure. So I didn't have to study very hard. And I have a brother that had the opposite experience. And so when I say to him, you know, I give him career advice, just do this, just do that, he looks at me like I'm an alien speaking an alien language. Because his experience of confidence and validation in what he can do and what he can achieve is very, very different to mine. The other thing that I think is really interesting that I've learned over the last couple of years is even if you're in like a special category, like, oh, I was sick for a long time, so I think I know about being sick for a long time, even within that category, don't develop the same kind of arrogance that I did to think that I can then understand anyone else's experience who's sick. I had chronic fatigue syndrome. Last weekend, I went to stay with my gorgeous friend, Nadine. She has multiple sclerosis. I have no idea what that's like, and it looks really, really bad. And I should never for a second think, oh yes, your experience of being sick and my experience of being sick are the same. They are nothing alike. They have some small things in common, but what she's going through is much, much harder. So even if you put yourself in some sort of protected category, uh, don't make assumptions about everybody else's uh, experience within that category. That's very, very important. All right, so let's... See what's coming up next. New slide. Uh, OK, let's summarize. So start with motivate yourself. Get out there, work, work, work out for you what's going to light a fire under your engine. Then educate yourself, do the research, learn to pay attention, identify your blind spots. This can start really small. Make a cup of coffee at work. Spend 15 minutes reading a blog post about a group of people that you don't have a lot of experience with. It can start that small and grow from there. You don't have to go and start a conference next week on diversity inclusion. Start where you are. I would love to come to a conference. This is my dream one day, like this. And the person up here talking about D&I is a white male. <laughs> I've never seen that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ladies are clapping. <laughs> the ladies are clapping. Uh, and then the last thing, the last thing, and this is really what I'm here to tell you to do, uh, or encourage you to do, is commit your actual time and actual energy. You have to give up programming in Go, I know it's a big ask, to spend time on this. I can see how much you all love it, it's beautiful. Um, but you do. So um, the good news, though, that I have for you is that um, if I go back to the women in tech thing for a second, because again, that's what I know, we have a pipeline problem. Uh, numbers of women enrolling in tech courses is dropping across the board in tertiary education. We have a hiring problem. Interviews are still heavily biased in favor of the norm, which tends to exclude people with a picture on the butt like me. Um, and we have an inclusion problem. So Accenture did a global study last year with Women Who Code organization, and they estimate that about now we've got about 24% uh, women in the technology space, which is OK, plenty of room for improvement. They estimate that by 2025, there will be 22% women in the technology space. 
So along with fewer women coming in, those of us who are here are leaving two to three times as frequently as men are leaving this industry. So that's awesome because there's plenty of space for you to get involved, help out, think about how you might be able to, to change something in your workplace. Cool. All right, let me give you a little bit of an example um, as to something that I do in this area. So uh, anyone who knows me, uh, and there's a fellow here who was on one of my teams, knows that I am totally obsessed by food. I think about it all the time, I talk about it all the time. If you're on one of my teams, we will celebrate with food, we will commiserate with food, we will connect with food, we will do plannings and retros with food, 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 all about the food. Um, by the end of the, the recent project that I was working on, I had three teams, approximately 30 people across a number of different areas, and these were the food requirements that I had to meet in order to plan a lunch or bake a cake or do some cookies or whatever it was that I was doing. You might see as you look around the circle here, some of these things are even in direct contradiction to each other. My ARFID friend uh, pretty much only ate plain chicken and beef. Occasionally he might have plain noodles uh, or fries, but that was about it. And cakes get really hard when you're trying to, yeah, very, very hard. Um, and so what did I do? I still kept planning lunches and still kept bringing donuts and still kept doing all that stuff. And most of the time I got it wrong. What I tried to do though was get it wrong a different way every time. So if I made a cheesecake for, I did, I made a cheesecake for their birthday, uh, and then next time I would make my vegan like chocolate peanut butter pie for these folks over here, and so on and so forth. And then the other thing that I did, which I think is critical when you're doing this kind of work, is I would acknowledge, like, and I never did it purposely, like I swear to God I tried every time. It took me a real long time to come around to lactose intolerant, I love dairy. Um, but when I realized that I'd done it, I would go over to the person or people and say, oh my gosh, I'm really, really sorry that I missed you out this time. Next time it's going to be all about you. I got to the point where I would then buy little things that were gluten-free or nut-free or whatever if I'd made something else. And then by our last team lunch, I was really pleased. We had a three-course team lunch at a gorgeous restaurant in Melbourne. Everyone had all three courses except my Arthur friend, he got two out of three. I didn't know he'd given up chocolate and the dessert was chocolate, but, but I tried. <laughs> and in the act of trying and acknowledging and apologizing when I got it wrong and trying to do better next time, everyone felt included. So even when you don't get it right, you can still get it right, which I think is something that's really important to remember. Okay, so. I think I want to end somewhere around here. This is really hard. Inclusion is never done, it's always doing, unless you can somehow find a way to freeze people in amber so that they never change. Uh, and so you're always going to be going, even if you get to that point where you're getting it right, you'll tip back into wrong again. So really, really important to keep your motivation up and really, really important, and I know for some people this can be a challenge, but start tiny and it'll get easier, I promise. But when you get it wrong, acknowledge, apologize, and this is the real, real important one. Try it differently next time. Show people with your actions that you want them to be included as much as the normal people are included. Yeah, beautiful. I think that was everything, yep. All right. <laughs> Look, this was already here before I came here today, but every talk has <laughs> had Go versus some language. So I'm going to do your Go for versus the Ruby. You clearly have the better logo. Look at that little fella. Um, ten years ago, roughly, I'm really bad at knowing when things happened. Uh, ten years ago, I went to my first RubyConf uh, as, a, as a fresh young developer trying to learn Ruby. And uh, I played Spot the Girl, and it took me till lunchtime. Uh, there was probably, I don't know, Three, similar size to this when the room was more full um, you know, of, of people in the conference. Uh, yeah, it took me till lunchtime to spot the girl and I went up to say hello to her and she was a recruiter, which is fantastic, but it did make me feel a little bit lonely. And um, my last RubyConf I went to, I think it was about two years ago, and the audience was 
I don't know, not great with numbers, but at least 30, 40 percent, not, not halfway, but 30, 40 percent female. The speakers were over 50 percent female. And that community, I think, for those of you that dabble uh, in Ruby, uh, is very, very good at being inclusive. They worked really, really hard. They've got amazing programs like Rails Girls and Rails Girls Summer of Code, uh, and they make sure that their material, their tutorials, just learning the language is a really friendly and welcoming experience in which it's okay to fail. I went to my first Go Meetup two and a half years ago. It was organized by Leah, fantastic, at Zendesk. And uh, she and I were the only women there. There was probably about 30 guys there. And most of the talks were on topics that were, from my perspective, I would describe as niche. And I left that meetup, sorry, Leah, <laughs> thinking, um, I don't belong here. And so when I sit here today and I see <coughs> the conference materials that you've produced and how inclusive that you're being, I think that's fantastic. And when I look around the room, there are definitely a lot more than just me and Leah here, so that feels really, really good. But there's a long way to go. Other people have done this before. I'm sure you know some of them. You can go talk to them and ask them what worked for them or what, what moved the needle. It's slow. It will take a while. These are things that shift very gradually in the beginning. And then they do pick up steam because people in a certain group no other people in that group, and they will bring them along for the ride. So I strongly recommend that you get out there, you get into this stuff. If this is something you care about, if this is something that you feel is important for the health of the Go community and for the longevity of the Go community, and I know that I do, then start to think, what can you do? Don't wait to be asked. Don't wait to be told. If you need an invitation, this is your invitation. I invite you to come and do this work with me and give this talk next time instead of me. And uh, I wish you very much the best.